Thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, I hope you're all staying safe and healthy during these times, wherever you're joining us from. Um, in today's webinar, I'll be sharing with you an exciting new initiative at the Texas A&M Energy Institute, the Convergence Research Incubator, which is a, a new initiative uh, that I'll be talking about today, which is coming at a time where our world is facing this uh, global pandemic, which is a very bold uh, example of the kind of complex challenges that we're facing today and that we need to prepare for as we move forward into the future. Uh, this pandemic is also uh, allowing us to reflect on the kind of uh, uh, investment in, in uh, research infrastructure that needs to happen to address such complex uh, multifaceted uh, challenges as we move forward. Um, in my talk today, I'll be uh, going over some of the global risks and complex challenges uh, that we're facing, introduce what convergence research is, uh, introduce the Convergence Research Incubator, its mission, vision, and goals, uh, outline some of the upcoming opportunities uh, that are coming up in the coming few months, as well as uh, outline the a timeline of uh, main milestones and activities uh, for the incubator uh, in the coming few months as well. Um, and we'll end in different ways uh, you can all participate. <clears throat> so I'd like to start with uh, this report by the World Economic Forum, uh, which uh, is an annual report that uh, outlines the risks that uh, we need to expect globally uh, in, in different years. Uh, the, the 2020 report came out recently outlining different economic, environmental, geopolitical, social, and technological risks. And this is the outcome of a survey that was sent out to more than a thousand business executives, uh, academics, NGOs, government uh, organizations, and international organizations globally uh, to rank the likelihood and impact of uh, these uh, risks uh, occurring in 2020. And we can see uh, how diverse uh, those risks are uh, when we're looking at different economic, environmental, social uh, risks, uh, and technological risks but also how complex these, these risks are and how multifaceted uh, they are. Uh, so as we uh, try to address those and as we work towards uh, addressing these, these challenges, uh, they cannot also be um, looked at independently and need to look at, at, at a systems, uh, systems perspective. So what, what do we learn from this? And, and I'd like to highlight here that uh, one of the main risks that was uh, in, this, uh, um, in this report and part of the survey was infectious diseases, uh, which we are uh, facing today. And we can see the low likelihood relative to other risks of, of, that, uh, of, of infectious diseases in, in this uh, survey and other risks that have been also, uh, that we've been seeing in, in the past month or two that have been happening with that infectious disease risk, uh, including uh, food crises, fa financial failure, uh, unemployment, energy price shocks, uh, global governance failure, which have all been um, also happening at, at the same time. Doesn't necessarily need to be a, a direct uh, causation, but um, the infectious disease um, has had a great uh, deal of potentially catalyzing these, these risks as well. So we can see this wide uh, range of uh, challenges. Given that most of these risks that we're seeing today uh, are on the la low likelihood um, uh, part of the spectrum, also gives us an indication on how hard these risks are uh, often to, to predict. And uh, these challenges are complex and are, are multifaceted and would require uh, uh, different uh, levels of solutions, whether we're looking at the technological, policy, social, behavioral um, interventions uh, that need to be made to, to address these. Uh, we can also reflect on the need for rapid response for addressing these challenges. And we are seeing this uh, today in our response uh, to COVID-19. Uh, as we don't have the luxury of time to respond, and in a very limited time, uh, we are seeing how uh, how we are in need of assembling different groups of uh, scientists across different disciplines, as well as 
uh, high level of cooperation between different types of stakeholders, where we're also seeing how important it is for um, for uh, public, private, and and uh, uh, governmental and industrial stakeholders to be working closely together to address such crises. In addition to that question, uh, uh, those respondents were also asked about how strongly interconnected they thought these global risks are. And we can see here the same um, uh, graph we saw on the previous slide, but looking at uh, a network of interconnections between these challenges. And we can see how uh, some of these uh, challenges are very tightly interconnected and could range from uh, different types of uh, risks, including environmental, geopolitical, social, uh, that are also tightly connected and need to be looked at in, um, in a systems perspective. So there's a, an important need for systems thinking as we look at these uh, challenges and risks as uh, complex systems within themselves and look at how they interconnect with other uh, challenges as we as we move forward and part of our preparedness to um, uh, to address such such complex uh, challenges moving forward is investing in necessary infrastructure to improve that our resilience uh, in terms of responding to those and the infrastructure doesn't have to be um, a bricks and mortar but is, is more also at the level of uh, investing in environments that allow innovating at the interfaces of different disciplines and probably the emergence of new disciplines, as well as innovating in uh, creating environments that, that also allow diverse actors to uh, cooperate at, at a high rate as well. So what are complex systems? To put things into perspective, uh, uh, this is a, a Stacy matrix uh, outlining different types of, of systems um, according to how certain uh, we are in terms of um, understanding them and addressing them, uh, as well as with a range of agreement from close to agreement and far to agreement in terms of decisions on, on uh, policies and, and management practices to, to address these challenges. So when we're talking about simple challenges, uh, they're often, um, uh, they are often systems with few elements where the cause and effect relationship is obvious to all. Uh, we gather that data from the past and learn uh, from that to predict the future. Uh, so these kind of systems, uh, uh, results uh, from these systems are often reproducible. Uh, they have few variables and we can develop best practices out of uh, responding to these uh, simple challenges. When we talk about complicated challenges, cause and effect relationship uh, is not as obvious, but is, uh, uh, requires a bit more uh, analysis and investigation in order to, to figure uh, how these greater number of elements uh, in these systems compared to simple systems are interacting. And we can see here that there are some uh, challenges that uh, experts know how to address and uh, have a high level of certainty on the tools and methods uh, that need to be used to address them. But there might be a higher level of uh, actors involved that might not agree on on ways forward. So that that is a case where in in some specific type of complicated uh, systems there would need to be uh, some negotiation because we have conflicting views and and some agreement needs to be made. On the other side, there's also a different type of complicated problems where um, uh, policy is clear on way to move forward, but there is uncertainty, some level of uncertainty in, in terms of uh, tools and methods to, to address those. With complicated challenges, there exists a solution or an optimum state, uh, but there might be multiple paths to, to that one single um, answer. With chaotic systems, there's no relationship between cause and effect at, at system level. Uh, there's high level of disagreement among large uh, numbers of groups. Uh, and there's high uncertainty in strategies to use to, to address these uh, systems and, and better understand them. And that range in the middle between complicated and chaotic systems is, is what is referred to as, as complex uh, systems, where we have many variables and many elements, including people, materials, different rules. And those elements highly interact, but those interactions can change over time. 
uh, cause and effect in complex systems might not be very obvious. So we tend to look more for patterns that we could recognize in, in within those systems, um, even though um, le uh, addressing those uh, or taking those patterns from one context to another might might change. So uh, there's a lot of uh, contextualized knowledge that need to be developed as we uh, address co co uh, complex challenges. Uh, so we can recognize patterns, but they might be hard to predict as we change context. Uh, when we talk about complex systems, uh, optimum solutions do not necessarily exist. Uh, and we're talking more about a continuum of possibilities or desired states. And that's where uh, more of the scenario planning comes into place as opposed to looking for, for optimum solutions. So one... <clears throat> One of those complex challenges, or some of those complex challenges that uh, uh, that I'm going to share with you here today, for, uh, as an example, is as we look at our growing global population, which is expected to reach nine billion by 2050, with uh, also a higher frequency of extreme events and economic growth or contraction, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, we have uh, projections to need. 55% more water by 2050, 60% more food, and 80% more energy. And these are grand challenges and complex challenges and systems within themselves. But reality is also these challenges are very much interconnected because most of the water, 70% of the fresh water goes into agriculture, where 15% uh, goes to, um, uh, to energy production. 30% uh, of the world's energy goes into uh, the food sector from farm to table. So these challenges are very much interconnected. And unless we look at them in, in a systems perspective and identify and quantify those interconnections between them, we would not be able to, uh, to address them properly. And I'd like to mention that we are facing these projections and challenges at the time where uh, currently today, 844 million people still lack access to safe drinking water, 815 million people still lack access to food, and 1.1 billion people still lack access to energy. And the reality is that these resource systems also do not exist in vacuum. They are very much uh, affected by different types of stakeholders that, uh, that consume, manage, regulate these resource systems, which we also need to understand. So we can look at uh, as we understand and address these challenges, we need to understand the interactions that's happening between those uh, players as well. So how do governments, uh, businesses, and, and civil society uh, interact? And what are the research questions that we need to address as we uh, address these challenges? And those interactions don't happen at one scale. They also happen on uh, across different scales. So as we look for solutions for uh, addressing these challenges and interventions across different uh, sectors to address these challenges, we need to make sure that there is um, uh, consistency and coherence across these uh, solutions across different scales so we don't end up uh, competing across different scales. Another example, which I'm also going to go over quickly, is looking at One Health and the interconnections between human, environment, animal health, and the different disciplines that are uh, required uh, for us to, to understand uh, these, uh, these challenges and, and address them uh, as we look at uh, um, inputs that engineering, social sciences and humanities, uh, biology, ecology could provide into, into these solutions uh, moving forward. So, so as we look at addressing these complex, um, complex challenges, given the input that is, would be required from, from this different disciplines to address them. Uh, so with that complexity, we can all agree that there's no one discipline uh, would be able to address these, that complexity of, of these challenges, and there's no one stakeholder that would be able to address them. So uh, three enabling environments that would allow us or prepare us to be better equipped to address these challenges is investing in uh, an enabling environment for researchers to uh, look at, to collaborate basically and, and um, explore the interfaces, innovate at the interfaces of these research disciplines as they address uh, these challenges. 
there's also an important need for uh, investing in an enabling environment, which also ensures that there's more um, uh, cooperation between different stakeholders that are also uh, within different sectors that are required to address these challenges. And also last but not least, making sure that as these uh, two, um, two worlds grow in their knowledge and in their cooperation towards addressing these challenges, that they're doing that hand in hand and there's a high level of um, uh, convergence as, as they develop that knowledge uh, and prepare, preparedness for action moving forward. So what have we been doing at the global uh, scale to address these challenges? Here I would like to um, to bring your attention to uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which uh, were agreed on by 193 heads of states in, uh, in 2015 uh, to work towards these goals, 17 goals, uh, in the coming 15-year period. We're already five years uh, uh, done and, and we still have 10 years to go till 2030. And those goals include um, uh, goals including uh, reducing poverty, uh, reducing hunger, uh, good health and well-being, quality education, uh, affordable and clean energy, um, partnerships uh, around goals, among others. And it's important as well as we work towards this common agenda globally uh, to work towards these, these goals to make sure that we also do that with an understanding of how interconnected these goals are so we don't end up putting uh, policies and, and strategies that compete with one another. So moving to the US and what we've been doing uh, uh, at, at, at the national level to push towards addressing these challenges, NSF uh, last year announced growing convergence research as one of its 10 big ideas and it, um, it framed it in as, as the kind of research that is needed to address grand challenges uh, of today, including protecting human health, understanding the food energy water nexus, exploring the universe at different scales. And it, it's pushing that as part of, uh, of its agenda moving forward and of the research that we need to develop as we, as we prepare to address uh, these challenges. So what, what is convergence research? So if we look at, at this, a spectrum here of disciplinary to transdisciplinary research. Um, I have some of the terms here that, that uh, kind of give, a, give us uh, an indication of, of uh, the kind of interaction that we're looking at between different disciplines as we uh, move forward in this spectrum with an example of uh, nanotechnology as an example of how physics, chemistry, biology, and engineering uh, have been able to uh, evolve into this uh, new discipline. So when we're looking at, at disciplinary research, we're looking at a specialization, con uh, concentrating on a specific discipline, which is addressing uh, a specific problem that is specific to that discipline. In multidisciplinary, separate uh, disciplines still uh, exist with distinct boundaries, but there's some level of coordination and sequencing that, that starts to happen between uh, these disciplines. At the interdisciplinary research, we're talking more about blending, integrating, synthesizing. So new sub-disciplines form out of, um, out of these uh, disciplines and there's a synthesis of new knowledge that, and frameworks that evolve uh, over, uh, due to the overlap and, and merging of these uh, disciplines. Moving to the transdisciplinary, we're talking about transcending existing disciplines and, and looking at how, uh, with the example of, of nanotechnology, how it becomes transcends into its own uh, discipline at an earlier stage and then at a later stage becomes its own discipline which interacts with different sets of stakeholder worldview and, and society. So convergence research is, is closest to uh, transdisciplinary research, but with the focus on the early engagement of, of different stakeholders and the intellectually diverse researchers from day one uh, into the process. And one way uh, convergence is defined by the National Science Council of uh, the National Academies in, in, in a report in 2014, outlines convergence as an approach to problem solving, that cuts across disciplinary boundaries and integrates knowledge, tools, and methodologies from engineering, life sciences, physical, uh, 
sciences, mathematical, computational, economic, social, and, and behavioral sciences. And NSF in its uh, 10 big ideas, in its description of uh, convergence research, it provides three main characteristics for this kind of research. First, it needs to be research driven by a specific and compelling problem, which, um, which is usually uh, uh, inspired by the need to address a specific challenge or opportunity, whether it's arising from deep scientific questions or uh, societal needs. The second characteristic is the deep integration across disciplines that is required, where uh, different knowledge, knowledge, theories, method, data uh, become increasingly intermingled and integrated and new frameworks and paradigms emerge. Uh, even new disciplines in some cases uh, emerge out of that interaction. And third, the inter integration from project inception, where with a convergence paradigm, we intentionally bring together those intellectually diverse researchers and diverse stakeholders from inception uh, to co-develop and co-frame these research questions and ways of communicating and adopting common frameworks for, for the sol uh, their solutions and uh, including developing their new scientific uh, vocabulary. So even though this process might be uh, messy in some ways by bringing everyone together at the same table from day one. It's, it's in the spirit of, of really uh, co-development of this, uh, this new knowledge and, and uh, co-framing those, uh, uh, those research questions moving forward rather than those coming uh, first from uh, the scientific community or, or otherwise. So given this momentum towards convergence research and the importance of uh, of addressing these complex challenges and, and preparing for addressing for, the, uh, for these complex challenges as we move forward. And given the, uh, the opportunities, the number of opportunities we have um, uh, ahead of us in the coming few months uh, in this space, in the convergence research space, and building on the, the wealth of, of knowledge and disciplinary expertise we have at Texas A&M and the wealth of um, uh, industry uh, as well as governmental and societal partners uh, across across the university. Um, uh, we are introducing this initiative at uh, Texas A&M, the Convergence Research Incubator, which uh, its vision is to sustain and expand the university's national and global leadership in the area of convergence research towards addressing these challenges and whose mission would be to uh, to provide a platform that catalyzes that uh, bringing people uh, from, from different uh, research disciplines and stakeholders to assemble teams to, uh, in order to, to go through that process of, of developing that, that kind of uh, convergence research and be uh, ready to, uh, to apply for external grants to, to grow their ideas further across different uh, disciplines and, and different uh, institutions uh, as, as they col collaborate. So the goals of the Convergence Research Incubator, uh, there are five main goals that, that we're moving with. Uh, mainly what, one is to contribute to fostering a convergence research environment across uh, different departments, centers, institutes, and colleges, provide seed fundings for teams uh, of researchers and stakeholders as they address these challenges, lead and support uh, uh, research activities that strengthen existing collaborations that we have and grows new ones uh, on campus nationally and, and globally, uh, participate in creating different convergence products uh, that address different uh, societal uh, challenges, um, not limited to, but for example, water, energy, food nexus, circular economy and sustainable development. And I'll be talking a bit more about those uh, later. And last but not least, uh, bolster A&M's competitiveness for grants uh, that demand proven record of, of success and cross-disciplinary coll collaboration. So the, the Convergence Research Incubator at, uh, at Texas A&M Energy Institute will be doing so building on three main uh, strengths. The first is the diverse initiatives that are uh, supported and partnerships uh, uh, for, with different initiatives uh, across campus, regionally and nationally, uh, which you can see on, on the slide here. I'm not going to go into detail, but just to give you an idea of some of the 
uh, academic and uh, industrial partners uh, that we will build on as we uh, as we as we move forward. Second, we will build on um, around 300 um, affiliates to the Energy Institute across uh, Texas A&M campuses uh, here in College Station, but also different campuses in in Texas and and uh, and Qatar as well. Uh, where we have around 300 affiliates across different colleges. As part of this activity, one of the things that, that we're also keen on doing is expanding uh, that uh, uh, list of uh, affiliates, especially in areas uh, of, uh, where, of social sciences, business, uh, and health sciences as well, um, to, to grow that list of, of affiliates in those, in those areas. And third, uh, we're going to also build on a successful internal grants program, which has been going uh, from 2015 till 2019, where in the past five years, uh, the Energy Institute has uh, granted 37 grants uh, with an average of 49K uh, each, a total of 1.36 million, which yielded more than 7 million of awards uh, from grant, uh, from uh, 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 federal and and industrial uh, uh, partners and or and institutions. And moving forward, there's an interest in uh, expanding that reach across different affiliates, as I mentioned, especially in in the social sciences areas uh, and health sciences. Uh, look at uh, cross college uh, cross college uh, proposals will be encouraged, and specific thematic areas which require convergence research will also be encouraged. To give you just a, a, a brief overview of some of these uh, upcoming opportunities which, uh, which lie ahead of us uh, that are related to convergence, which, uh, uh, which we will be focusing on uh, as part of the Convergence Research Incubator. Well, one of those opportunities is the Growing Convergence Research Call, which is a call for a Center for Convergence Research. Uh, wh whose deadline is uh, next year, uh, early next year in February 2021, uh, with an award uh, up to 3.6 million over five years. Uh, there's also another uh, convergence-related uh, call uh, from the environmental convergence opportunities in chemical, bio bioengineering, environmental, and transport systems with thematic areas that also relate to sustainably supplying water, food, and energy, curbing climate change and adapting to its impacts, uh, designing a future without pollution, creating efficient, healthy, resilient cities, and fostering informed decision and actions, which is also due the same month, uh, which is also an award of 1.5 to 1.7 million over a three-year period. Uh, another two awards, which I think would be interesting uh, for, for this group as well is, uh, the Civic Innovation Challenge, which is also a research and action competition uh, in, in the smart and connected communities, which is uh, split into two stages, first of which is due in, in July, which also focuses a lot on, uh, on really starting with the stakeholder engagement piece and identifying needs among communities before going and doing the, the research. So uh, this is what, what this call uh, uh, emphasizes on. And then there's the NSF Convergence um, Accelerator, which also is split into two phases. Uh, for this year, um, uh, the two tracks that are uh, focused on are quantum technology and AI-driven innovation via data and model sharing, uh, with an award up to six million uh, for both phases over uh, three years. Uh, last but not least, there's also uh, part of uh, USDA's NIFA's budget. There's no specific call yet that, uh, uh, that is out there, but uh, uh, NIFA has uh, proposed to invest $98 million in sustainable agricultural system programs uh, with the goal of advancing the convergence of agricultural sciences with engineering, data sciences, nutritional food sciences, social sciences, and other disciplines like nanotechnology, computational, and advanced uh, manufacturing. So all of these are examples of some of the opportunities out there, and there are there's anticipated more, more opportunities, but this is this is an example of what's what's out there right now. So in terms of uh, the convergence research incubator and the timeline and milestones um, uh, ahead of us, 
Uh, first of all, I'd like to invite you to go to the uh, to the Texas A&M Energy Institute website, to the Convergence Research Incubator website, and and sign up in order to uh, get on the mailing list uh, for you to uh, to receive updates on on future activities that I'll, I'll be outlining now. Uh, one of the first things we're starting with, and in the spirit of trying to take a, a bottom-up approach in this to try to identify what are the areas of, of strength that, that we have um, uh, on campus and with, with different partners nationally uh, and internationally in, in areas of, uh, in thematic areas of interest. So instead of uh, that, the, dictating the thematic areas of this, uh, of, of, of the incubator moving forward, uh, the first step will be to identify where where are our strengths uh, and what what different uh, people are working on and where how can we identify these uh, clusters of strengths so part of that survey would ask about the uh, grand challenges that uh, that you're working on if you're interested to lead uh, or support uh, a project uh, or a team moving forward and the different skills and methods from your discipline that you can bring uh, into a team you will notice part of the survey will have uh, four thematic areas, uh, namely the water, energy, food, health, nexus, sustainable development goals, uh, energy digitization, and sustainable energy systems for the future, uh, future of manufacturing and circular economies, resilient supply chains of the future. These are ideas and these are areas that are of interest to us, but we also highly encourage uh, uh, participants and, and those who take the survey and are interested in, in joining us on, on this journey to uh, add um, thematic areas of interest that they are working on and are interested to, to bring to the table as well. Um, the, the survey is going to be sent out to, uh, to this group and, and including um, Energy Institute um, uh, affiliates at the first stage. I would highly uh, encourage you and would appreciate if you could share the, those um, this information about the survey with faculty you might think would be interested in uh, being engaged in, in, such a, in such an activity so we could uh, uh, gather more input on what people are working on and be able to develop those thematic areas. So this survey will run until May 15th after which uh, we'll take a couple of uh, weeks and we'll report on the results of this survey, as I mentioned, to identify and share with you the clusters that uh, came out of the survey, telling us what our area, areas of strength are and, um, and identify those who are interested to form teams and, and lead teams around these uh, topics. So those who indicated that they're interested in leading teams um, around the grand challenges they indicate in the survey will have the chance to pitch those ideas and, and form teams in a webinar we're planning in mid-June where we'll have a lineup of, of those who want to, um, uh, to form teams and lead teams to give a brief pitch uh, around the challenge they're interested to work on and, and the kind of team they're, they're looking to, uh, to create. Uh, different teams might be in different uh, stages of development. Some teams might have some members and are looking for a specific discipline or a specific area of expertise they're interested in, in adding to their team. Uh, in terms of team formation and, and criteria, we'll be sharing more information about that uh, uh, in, 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 uh, as, as we move forward. But we're looking uh, mainly to have at least one um, Energy Institute affiliate as part of that team, one non-academic stakeholder or extension agent as part of that team uh, in the spirit of including stakeholders from day one into, into the teams as we form those research questions. Uh, Cross-college collaboration will be highly encouraged as well as cross-institutional collaboration given that a lot of these proposals uh, also are multi-institutional uh, proposals. So following the webinar and the pitches, we'll have a few, a couple of weeks to, to, to get those uh, teams formed and uh, the result of which would be a two-page concept note, uh, kind of solidifying uh, the team members and the idea that, that is being addressed. And uh, that would be 
the end of, of phase one of, of this activity, having those teams formed and having concept notes uh, for the ideas representing each, uh, each of these teams. Uh, phase two will include transforming these concept notes into white papers that outline the, the, the research questions at the interfaces of these disciplines that are involved around these different, um, uh, different grand challenges, which uh, we would like to publish in a special issue by the end of the year, where we can publish that collectively as, as, a, as a special issue dedicated to convergence research uh, topics or emerging topics in, uh, uh, that require uh, convergence research which could be um, a collective effort across, uh, across all the, uh, the faculty and, and stakeholders that would be involved in this process. And the second, uh, the second outcome of phase two will be also uh, providing seed grants to, um, to uh, uh, some of those teams that um, uh, develop these uh, concept notes also with the goal of, in addition to contributing to the special issue, also uh, being ready to um, to submit to larger grant proposals within within a year's time. Um, uh, at this point, I uh, as we are in phase one, uh, I don't have specific information that I can share with you at this point on on the grant amounts. But uh, this will be highly dependent on um, on the level of participation we get, and as we progress forward, we'll we'll be sharing more information with you. Uh, about that. Um, this is this is the timeline in a nutshell for for the coming for the rest of the year at least the rest of this year uh, till December 2020. Uh, again, if you are interested in in this uh, timeline and in this uh, uh, these milestones and these activities that that we're doing in the coming few months, please go to uh, our website and. Um, uh, sign up, register, or sign up your your name and give us your information so we could uh, co communicate with you on on next steps. This is it for now. Uh, I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions. Uh, if we do not, um, if you still have any questions that uh, we would uh, that will not be addressed now, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, at bdaher at uh, tamu.edu. Thank you. Thank you, Basil. That, that was great. Um, if you have any questions, you can either type them or, or uh, add. So, if you are about for I can see if there are questions, uh, Valentini. Are there any in the chat box? Did we lose Valentini? Yeah. Basil? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. It's Kent. Um, congratulations. This is, uh, you've made great progress on this. This is, looks very exciting. A couple of quick um, um, suggestions. Uh, one thing is um, uh, to consider working with scholars at tamu.edu and Bruce Herbert uh, to uh, create a, um, a special uh, subgroup for, uh, for CORE. Um, I'm sure he'd be happy to, to work with you to create that, that subgroup. Um, he's been working with institutes and centers to, to do that for them, and this would, would make perfect sense. I would also say that the, um, the process you've laid out very much parallels the X grant process, the internal grant process that AM has going on. And at that later stage where you're talking about two pagers and concept proposals, it may be uh, worthwhile adding the idea of facilitating application for X grants mm. that will then lead to, uh, to large external grants. So it's just little pieces that you could add to this that would uh, uh, maybe um, uh, make it even more successful. Thank you for your presentation.
Absolutely. Thank you very much for this feedback. Um, hello, this is Lucy Camacho, Texas A&M Kingsville. Can you hear me? Hi, Lucy. Yes. Hi, thank you. Uh, just, uh, for, just to share that uh, uh, a team that I am leading, uh, including Texas A&M, uh, Prairie View, Commerce, and Texas Tech University, we submitted a proposal to NSF for this ECO CBT uh, uh, solicitation early this year. We received uh, good feedbacks, even though we didn't receive the funding, of course, but we are looking forward to submit it again next um, in February. So um, we have uh, the opportunity to um, improve the proposal and, and let's see how it goes. But just, I just wanted to share it with, with the group. Absolutely. Please, please do share that information in, in the survey so that is reflected in, in the report as we report those, uh, those results to everyone and share them with the group. Yeah, I would be glad to. This is Micah Green. I was wanting to ask a little more about those webinars and how that's going to be set up, like what the format will be. Valentini, would you like to respond to that? Ah, the, the, the webinar, which webinar are you talking I, about? I hope you can hear me. That's, uh, all the Mike, Mike, I yes, think I, I misunderstood your question. You, you're, you're talking about the, the webinar for the, in June, the mid, mid yes. June webinar. Yes. So the, the plan for that webinar, as, as I said, part of the survey. Uh, I think will, the yeah, uh, part of the survey uh, would ask, so it's a short survey, four or five questions asking about uh, the grand challenge you are working on. Um, whether you are interested in leading, uh, forming a team, or, or supporting a team, uh, the, uh, the method skills that, that you use or the disciplinary expertise that you can bring to the table. Uh, so those who indicate that, um, that uh, are interested in leading the uh, teams would have the chance to, uh, to give a pitch in, in that webinar. So that webinar would also be set in, in Zoom as we're doing today. And we'll have a clearly defined lineup of speakers where each speaker would have one slide uh, with a few minutes to, uh, to pitch their idea basically and see if anyone from the greater group uh, matches the skill that they're looking for. Uh, so it will be a chance to, to facilitate that team formation and uh, to, uh, to, to bring teams together basically and, and the chance for whoever is leading a team to have access to, to that group uh, of, of, of people from different disciplines and, and stakeholders from different sectors as well. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? So as, as we move forward, we're going to be uh, updating the, the core website with, with our activities, uh, including the, the survey and other um, uh, deadlines and dates that uh, the timeline that I just shared with you uh, and would be um, uh, a place to go to for updates. And as I said, once you join our mailing list, uh, we will be also communicating that uh, information with you as, as we move forward. Are there any uh, specific uh, thematic areas of interest that uh, you did not see uh, uh, on, on the list that I shared, which you think would be, uh, you would like to add to the list? I mean, you're gonna um, have the chance to reflect on that and, and share in the survey, but uh, since we're all here and we have a few more minutes, maybe we can discuss. Uh, good afternoon, Basil. This is Virender Sharma from School Hello. of Public Health. Yes, nice thank you. It's excellent, uh, excellent uh, webinar. I learned a lot, so I appreciate you took efforts to do it, and definitely I like to get involved, and we can discuss later. I think it's uh, maybe in this particular environment, maybe public health can be more emphasized. This not just for my own sake, maybe um, how water, energy, food 
have uh, ultimate relationship with the public health. Absolutely. And maybe somehow, I don't know the answer of this right now, but uh, can we emphasize all those things related to uh, public health and you mentioned community uh, health too. Yeah. So I think that that will, I think, bring more to the international level, this initiative. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, one of the, the thematic areas uh, uh, we explicitly have there, water, energy, food, health nexus. So we added that health in there, uh, given the importance of and the interconnection between between public health and, and the health system uh, with, with water, energy and food. And uh, given the current uh, uh, environment also and, and the challenges we're facing, it's, it's very timely to include that as well. Yeah. Because even in food, uh, there's a relationship to the disease. Yeah. And uh, so that may be some expertise from a and and I would like to get involved that too, we can include or explore maybe together or, or your team. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Are we getting any uh, questions in the chat box? Not in the chat box. I think it was only Michael okay. Green and then the internet collapsed here. So. Okay. So we if, have if, four more minutes for, for questions. Yeah. I have a question if, um, about yes. can, can you just explain a little bit how the uh, teams can be formed? What uh, you mentioned, one faculty affiliates from the Energy Institute, just just to elaborate a little bit on that part. Yeah, as as I mentioned, the the webinar would be a, a chance to uh, to form those teams. Uh, of course, uh, whoever is is interested in in forming a team could would be able to to start that process before the webinar. But the goal of the webinar is uh, to make sure that. Uh, for those teams who are still looking for um, a faculty or, or uh, an extension uh, expert maybe uh, in a specific area that they would need to, to cover the aspects of, of their project and, and proposal, uh, that would be a good chance to do it. Uh, so, um, so they would be uh, having that uh, opportunity to make a pitch for their, their project, to describe their team that they have and, and the the gaps they currently have in their team as, as they build those. Um, and in terms of the criteria, uh, um, as I said, I mean, a lot of these um, proposals, the larger proposals are either um, uh, multi-institutional, so that is encouraged. If you have a partner from, from another university who you'd like to bring in, that, that would be encouraged. If you have uh, uh, cross uh, college partners, obviously would be highly encouraged uh, given that a lot of these uh, problems and challenges would require different disciplines. Um, and, and having one EI affiliate will, will also be uh, part of the criteria. Um, and last but not least, also making sure that we have at least one stakeholder in that group uh, from day one that is also involved in uh, in those research questions that are being developed uh, at, at a very early stage. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I don't know if we have, uh, we can if have we one, one more question or not, and uh, yeah. Yeah. otherwise we can I mean, wrap maybe up. We can, we can yeah, wait one more minute, and if there's no questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me again uh, at B-D-A-E-H-E-R, bdaher at tamu.com and uh, I'd be happy to answer all your questions. I have one question or more of a comment. Yes. Can you hear me? Um, so I think one subtopic of the convergence um, uh, I, uh, this idea of convergence is um, natural disasters. So um, for everybody else here, I'm a PhD student from the civil engineering department and our research group does a lot of work on this convergence issue, like working with social scientists, other engineering disciplines, public health. Um, 
to look at how infrastructure systems are impacted during disasters and how it affects our communities differently. So I think this is another subtopic that could fall under um, the other research ideas. And another question for you, Basil, is yeah. for we have a research group and research team already. How could we be involved? Again, the, the survey is the first uh, starting point to be involved. So, uh, so basically, whoever is going to participate in the survey would have their input reflected in those clusters that would form and that would uh, uh, dictate the direction of, of the Convergence Research Incubator moving forward. So again, we're taking a bottom-up approach with this. We're giving some suggestions of some of the areas that are of interest to us at the Energy Institute, but but also there's gonna be another option and you will be highly encouraged to, uh, to indicate different uh, similar projects that you are talking about like natural disasters and, and, and others uh, that, that could be included in, in that group. Again, this, is, this will be an exercise to identify who's interested in, in, in doing this kind of research and where are our current uh, uh, areas of strength. Uh, as opposed to uh, dictating those thematic areas from, from day one. So um, if your research group participates in this uh, survey, make, uh, be sure that, that that input will be heard and will be reflected into that, uh, into that report. Uh, Basil, just to, to add uh, that uh, by the end of today, uh, the link with the survey is going to go out to all the attendees yep. of the webinar. So you should uh, look for, a, for an email from us. So everyone who participated today will receive uh, uh, the survey and uh, I would hope that you take that survey when things are still fresh. Uh, and we'll be sharing that, that survey also more broadly uh, in the coming few days as well. Okay, so we'll, All right. I think we can uh, wrap up. Do we, do we have uh, our last... Uh... Do we want to announce uh, the next seminar? Uh, yes. Yes, I think that will be good just to, to wrap up. Uh, first of all, Basil, thank you so much. Uh, we will, we're looking forward to hear from you in the, in the near uh, future. The webinar series, as I mentioned, was only the start uh, for uh, this, uh, this period, uh, this different period for all of us uh, from the Energy Institute. So the next seminar is going to be on May 1st. Uh, the title of it is going to be Current Oil Crisis and the Long-Term Energy Outlook by Dr. Mukul Batia. And uh, you can visit our website on the events to, to register or on the email you will receive from us uh, by the end of today, you can register there. Thank you everyone for joining and uh, we hope to see you again on the next uh, webinar. Thank you everyone.